Uh, Dr. Bryce, when you started, you said there was one convincing story. Could you elaborate on that about Jesus when you did the research? Uh, the, I wouldn't say this is necessarily true, a, a true story, but the story of the rich young ruler and a good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life, I at least don't see a likely Old Testament original for that one. It's conceivable, it's suggested by Naaman, the Syrian general who seeks out Elisha to be healed of leprosy, but it, it's not that close to it. And so that, I don't know where that would have come from, but that doesn't mean it's actually historical. It's just that's the only one I couldn't see a plausible connection with a, some Old Testament mm. story. Uh, Dr. Carrier, have you seen much headway in adoption of the methodologies that you espouse in proving history? Oh, no, because <laughs> historians are scared of math. <laughs> so, that. Even though it only requires sixth grade math, I've found that historians don't even know sixth grade math. I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. No, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was actually giving a tutorial on the application of Bayesian reasoning to a whole room of New Testament and biblical scholars, uh, professors, like some of them Ivy League professors. And I was doing a sample equation on there, and I used like a, did a dog eat my homework? Like, if your student claims a dog ate his homework, what would it take for you to believe that? And I model their, you know, so like model it with Bayesian reasoning so you can understand how you, you're already thinking like a Bayesian. But, um, so anyway, so I was doing this, I was doing some, doing some numbers on there, and I had 80% times 100%. And one of these, an Ivy League professor said, oh, wait a minute, 80% times 100%, that's 800%. What kind of result is that? <laughs> And, and, and I was like, I had this sinking feeling like, oh, <laughs> holy crap, how far back do I need to go? I very calmly explained it's 0.8 times 1, but the, the funny thing is, is he's wrong twice. Because even if you do the math the way that apparently he thought he was, you were supposed to do the math, it should be 8,000%. <laughs> um, it's just... It's just 80%, people. So, um, He's not talking about <laughs> me, but he might as well. <laughs> Though I have to say, for a total mathophobe like myself, he does such a good job in proving history of breaking down this very scary Bayesian analysis formula and just saying, oh, well, we can just replace this, 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 and show he... he Puts it into common English. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but I think ultimately, though, even when historians try to argue against me and they use their own methodology, I can actually model what they're doing with Bayesian reasoning, and I can actually point out what, where their error is, and I can translate it back into plain English so they don't even know they've been Bayesian. <laughs> You've been Bayesian, uh, um, man. Yeah. And I think that's, that's <laughs> the real value of the tool, is that you can actually analyze the arguments that historians are already making, and they don't even realize that they're making these Bayesian arguments. And when you find good arguments, you can show, Bayes, Bayes' theorem can show why that argument is good. And when they make a bad argument, Bayes' theorem shows why it's bad. And so it's, it's a useful tool. I wish more historians would shine up to it, because it's so valuable and so effective. Um, yeah, okay. uh, this is sort of a, this is for anyone who wants to uh, answer it. As a, as a layman, my, uh, my understanding of the, the history of Christianity itself is that there, was a, that there was a core Jewish movement that then was expanded into, um, into Greek synagogues, and I'm, uh, the question's coming in a bit, but which, I, which I, have, I don't know what the consensus is on that, but that's what I've taken for granted. I mean, even as a, that even matches what believers say. Um, about a year ago, I, got, I started thinking, about loan words and the way the way loan words move across languages with the with ideas and like uh, a couple examples the uh, ancient Sumerians were the first mathematicians 3,000 years later the Babylonians used Sumerian loan words for mathematical terms um, Hindi words went with Buddhism um, you, uh, you can just you could come up with a whole long line of examples of this I have trouble finding Hebrew words in the New Testament. All of our loan words for Christianity are Greek, right. which makes me think that not only is Jesus a myth, but perhaps the perhaps the uh, the notion about the uh, there being a Jewish um, Israeli church right. might also be a mythological. And I wondered what you thought of yeah. that. Well, I don't really have an opinion on that because um, it does. That depends on how you deal with Galatians, for example, and some and the letters of Paul, there's different ways that you can treat that evidence. Uh, and I haven't really examined that particular ar ar argument as to are there Hebrew loan words and so on. Um, and, and that runs into the whole Maurice Casey argument as to whether you can extract Aramaic from Mark. And, um, so I don't have an opinion on that myself. Um, what, what, what would you well, say? there have been people that argued, I think Frank Zindler argues this today, 
uh, but uh, Gordon Rylands and uh, some of these other people under the influence of my favorites, the Dutch radical mm -hmm. critics of the 19th century, uh, suggested that Christianity grew out of this Logos philosophy of Alexandrian Jews like Philo and, and others, and that from there it uh, made its way into Palestine and got Judaized, right. uh, a New Testament word, by the way. Right. and. Uh, and that uh, you, uh, I mean, it's obvious in any way you read it. Uh, if the fundamentalists are even talking about how Paul is dealing with Judaizers and so on. Yeah, that, that's certainly going on. The question is, could Jewish Christianity be a Jewish absorption of this Alexandrian Logos uh, philosophy? We know something like that happened in Asia Minor with Judaism uh, merging with the Dionysus religion to form the Sabasius religion. And, and this is, would be a very similar sort of a thing. And there are important things in early Christianity like uh, the Eucharist, the, the communion, that has nothing to do with the Passover or reinterpretation of it. It's right out of Dionysus and Osiris. Uh, and the, Dion the Osiris religion, they would, he was a dying and rising savior god, and he was the, uh, the spirit of fertility and so forth. So his followers drank beer or wine as his blood, because it's the blood of the grape or the barley or whatever, and, and ate bread as his body, because again, grain god, or C.S. Lewis had a corn king. There is no way that the uh, Last Supper business it has Jewish roots. The idea of blood drinking, uh, in, even symbolically, is absolutely abhorrent in Judaism. You might as well have a sacrament using imagery of child molestation. <laughs> it, it, out of what the question. What would do that, though? Uh, <laughs> And, and so uh, it, it, there are things that certainly look to me like this. It's just that we have an embarrassment of riches. There's also a kind of, there are echoes in the Old Testament suggesting that ancient Israel already had Yahweh as a dying and rising God like Marduk and others. And, uh, and that, so th there, there was all sorts of interchange and common beliefs around the Mediterranean. They weren't sealed off from one another. So it could be borrowing from uh, Greek and Egyptian religion, but it may just be the common inheritance of, of the Canaanites and, and so forth. Uh, the ancient Israelites were Canaanites, and so it's hard to tell, but it's that kind of thing. Where did it come from? It might have come from Alexandria. From the Greeks. Yeah. From the Greeks. Yeah. And yeah. there was a Jerusalem I mean, church, there's an Alexandrian church, there's a Syrian church, there was every all scattered all over the Rome. It didn't just our snowball our down Golgotha. Our, it was our it appeared everywhere. Is so poor, yeah. Right. Right. The story is that it started it started in Israel among people who were presumably speaking Aramaic or uh, but there's no presumably, sure. there's presumably. No they made it words and I mean I can't even find the word Messiah in the New Testament. They all Yeah, say you're right. Well Christ. you have like Kephos, you have a few things, but um but yeah, I mean, there might be something to investigate. There. Well, I wanted to go back to what uh, Bob was saying about the Lord's Supper. Um, Paul never calls the Last Supper the Last Supper. He always calls it the Lord's Supper, and he's always very clear that now this is our Lord's Supper, not like all those other Lord's Suppers. Those are the tables of demons. That's their, this is this is the real Lord's Supper, That's you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have another. Tell you something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have another question. Yeah. Mm. Uh, all three of you seem to be saying that uh, Christianity is what a superman is God, cult would look like in year 4000. But why can't it be a Chuck Norris is God, cult in year 4000? In other words, uh, why couldn't Jesus be, have been a mendicant preacher, was oh, there for a few been. years? It's just that but all then of the, the stories grew so much that the problem is we have so many different ones, and they all sound good until you read the next one. Yeah, well, I think you know. that gets to the question of what you think about Paul's letters, because there doesn't seem to be a preacher in Paul's letters, right? Um, when, when he talks about Jesus, he never mentions Jesus having a ministry. He never mentions him picking disciples. He never even, there's even a passage in Romans, I think Romans 10, where he says, uh, the only way you could ever have heard Jesus preach is if you're an apostle. Exactly. 
exactly. when he's writing to Jews and like, yeah. well, wait a minute, what about all those thousands of Jews in Galilee? Didn't they hear Jesus preach? And not just Paul, but all the New so Testament writers saying things right. like, he's been a secret up till now, but now he's yeah. revealed. Now he's on earth. Wait, right. wait no, he's dead now, but yeah. no, no, it's, now he's with us. They're saying. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of like Paul, like they're just the Jesus of the Gospels is almost erased from Paul, uh, and that that's the reason why we think. That the religion, and Paul is earlier, right? His letter, the right. seven authentic state to the fifties, ideally, right? Uh, right yeah, well, but, but the consensus sure view. But, yeah. the gospels. <laughs> sure, they're earlier than gospels. Um, so the point is, is that that the the Christianity of Paul does not appear to have a human Jesus running around Galilee and, and having a ministry, and then and then suddenly decades later, the gospels have all these fabulous stories that suddenly yeah. that Paul had never heard of. Yeah. Um, and so that's why the Reconstruction does look like it began as a revelatory cult. They were having visions of Jesus, finding messages in Scripture, and then that's what the religion they were spreading. And then later someone created these stories that put him on earth to sort of allegorize the points they wanted to make, or to create their own Scripture, really. Sure. It's the same thing that happened to Moses, right? There was no Moses. Sure. But someone wanted to have this authoritative figure in order to hang all of their teachings, and so they just created a story and just invented the whole thing. They gave him a family with names and, you know, the whole deal. Um, and it's just, as a Jewish sect, the Christians did the same thing uh, with Jesus that they did with Moses. And those early Christians are always saying, Jesus is going to come, Jesus is going to come. They never talk about him coming back. They never yeah, talk about true. him coming yeah. back. Yeah. So my question was largely taken over by the previous two questions. <laughs> what, what really convinced me that Jesus never existed was Paul. Paul does not speak of a living Jesus. He speaks of a godly Jesus okay. uh, up in the heavens. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, plus many of his, of his letters are um, creations of other writers. That's right. And yeah. so it's, it's, but that was, that was what convinced me. Was if Paul didn't think of a living <laughs> Jesus, why should I? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and like the, the, the yeah. earliest <laughs> pre-Pauline element we have, one of them, if not the oldest, is the Kenosis hymn in uh, Philippians, where the Jesus that's described in there is this stealth Messiah that, you know, empties out and is, no one knows who he is, and if the demons of this world had known who he was, they would never have crucified him in the first place. Yeah. And the clincher well, in that... That's Corinthians 2, but is, you're right. Uh, well, uh, well, no, 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 the Kenosis... Two, but but the, the not, demons not knowing... Really. Oh, sorry, you're right. The so-called uh, archons, however you translate that. Exactly. There's, that's but, a debate. But the thing about the Kenosis hymn is one of the lines saying that because... Uh, Jesus was um, faithful even unto death, then he got the name above every name. It's like, wait, wait, he got the name Jesus after he died? Is what this early thing is saying? And that's exactly what it's saying. Um, uh, uh, Paul yeah, it's shocking. Yeah. It looks that way, yeah. Yeah, it, it certainly reads that way, yeah. A uh, comment before my question. Um, you mentioned the stories around the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, he dies in one day in the biblical accounts. Crucifixion was meant to be a slow, excruciating death. No one was lucky enough to die in one day. It took about three to four days and involved basically a slow uh, suffocation. So I always thought it odd after I'd read Roman history <laughs> that Jesus should die in one day. Uh, if you buy into the idea that God intends him to have this very, um, abysmal de a death to redeem us, then why didn't it go on for four days? Yeah. Well, if they took him down, he had passed out, and he was probably still alive. <laughs> My uh, question has to do with uh, another area of ferment that was going on in Israel at, at this time, first century BCE, and that's the, the uh, dissent within Judaism, the Essene cult, um, and there's another group, and I name escapes me right there now. It has always bothered me. I was thrilled to death when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. I was uh, about 10 years old when I found it out. It's been 70 years, and we still do not have um, as they mm -hmm. sat on those scrolls, the scholars who have the capacity to translate them, there has to be a motivation beyond, you know, one guy wants to trump another. Why do you think we don't have clear-cut translations? We do, finally. Finally. And we have for a, about uh, 15 years or so. How long? about 15 years or so, and they're all in English translation, but you're right, decades went time. by. And yeah. I think actually it was 
just uh, professional pompousness and uh, these guys uh, who were chosen to study the scrolls wouldn't let anybody else see them except for their own grad students and actually willed custody of their scrolls to their students so nobody else could say the first word about them until these guys had exhausted it and gotten famous for, for being the experts on the scrolls because once you see what's in them, there's no smoking gun like we kind of thought because otherwise, I mean, you think, could these, you know, it's like a conspiracy theory that there's something in there that the Catholics don't want us to see. That's not unreasonable, though it turned out, ah, there was no, no <laughs> weapons of mass destruction in the scrolls. And, and uh, I, I think it was, I mean, it's even more scandalous that these pompous asses were just sitting on them the whole time. Uh, and uh, I, I, it's even worse that it's just academic politics and so forth. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's tens of thousands. Yeah. yeah, there's tens of thousands of these Sumerian tablets, uh, literature, documents, ast astronomical documents, scientific documents. Well, it's for want of translators. We don't yeah. have we don't have the people. We have we have thousands of papyri as well. I mean, I, I got briefly involved in this and got the hell out because I did not want to be a papyrologist. Um, but when I was in Colombia, I took I you know I studied under you know uh, Bagnall, who was like one you know the world's leading papyrologist, and it took you know a year's worth of papyrology with him, um, and found out like you you can spend like months trying to translate a freaking fragmentary. Tax receipt. That was I did a tax receipt. I, and you, can, you can find this. You can. I have it all. I put it all up on my website. But uh, it's in the science section uh, from the front page, richardcarrier.info, if you're interested. And um, but the thing is, is that the, I, so I, I and apparently other students before me had done this, and I got further than any other student before him. And he, he thought I was the golden child, and he was <laughs> grooming me to be like a, a new papyrologist. And, but by this time, I was like, I don't want to do this over and over again. I've been working on this thing for a year. And I got to the point where I had everything translated except there was one, because it's all torn up and stuff, so there's one name. The only thing apparently that was useful in this tax receipt was the name of the tax collector because it was a name we didn't have and that's what they like to have new data. And, but I couldn't figure out what the name was. I brought it to, you know, back now I couldn't figure out what the name was. We brought in like these like world leading papyrologists at, the, at you know, like a little cocktail party mm -hmm. and we had like the, the hyper, uh, hyper accurate photos and stuff and everybody's looking at it and none of these guys could figure out the name and I'm like, and they said, oh, it's not publishable without the name. And I'm like, I've been working on this for a year. Um, and it turned out it was Hillary Clinton. <laughs> 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 anyway, that, that put me off papyrology. So I got the hell out of papyrology and didn't, didn't continue it. But the, the, there's a lot of these documents out there that can have all kinds of information mm. in them. All the, all the really good stuff, though, get plum picked. You know, they get cherry picked and they get published. You know, like if you find a lost play of Sophocles, it's yeah. going to get published. But, uh, but a lot of this other stuff, no. I mean, so there are, there are thousands of papyri just sitting untranslated, but they're usually things like that that are not yeah. amazing. But in the Sumerian case, there's probably lots of really great and excellent stuff. It's just nobody cares about ancient Sumer. Right. Right. And this, this is one of the examples of the argument in Hector Avalos' book, The End of Biblical Studies, where his whole point is, well, look at the massive amount of personnel we are wasting on the Bible. Dude, there's all this other literature, and our, our heritage of our history is disappearing. Spread out a little. <laughs> <laughs> is kind of his argument. And like, meanwhile, like, people like Josh McDowell are saying, oh, let's destroy Egyptian mummies to see if they have fragments <laughs> of the Gospels in them. Yeah, it's like, if those are even authentic. So, that's so we, we have other questions. Let's sure, let's oh, go yeah, for it. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to rant on my tirade about papyrology. <laughs> so as I look into this topic, because I find it fascinating myself, uh, I've kind of come to the conclusion that the Christ or the Jesus is a collection of traditions of various types. Um, and so I was reading Revelation the other uh, month ago or so, uh, and 314 stuck out at me when it's talking about the Amen. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and it's referring to Jesus as the Amen. And so I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. What's going on here? <laughs> um, and just a little bit of reading, and I, don't, I haven't done enough to verify it or anything, but the potential that it could be referring to Amun, which mm -hmm. is the hidden one or the unknown mm -hmm. one, and then you combine that with Paul and Acts talking about, oh, well, here's the, here's the unknown God, the altar to the unknown mm -hmm. God. And then, uh, what was it, Hadrian's letter to Zervanius uh, comparing Christ uh, or, or in Serapis, 
Yeah, all the and, Christian priests are priests of Serapis. Yes, yeah, and, and my understanding is Serapis was the the unknown um, the unknown statue or something. I don't know if that's connected or not, but I sort of get this thing like, okay, was there sort of a movement going on uh, where you you have this this unknown entity that was revealed? David, as you had mentioned, uh, Paul talking about, oh, Jesus was unknown, and now all of a sudden it's become a known sort of thing. I'm just like. Was there this movement going on where there's this very generic but like unknown thing that was becoming known? Well, Marcion. It's unknown, actually. <laughs> Marcion said that uh, Jesus was revealing a God hitherto unknown, an alien God, not the creator, not the Hebrew God, but a God of love and forgiveness, and that Jesus was the son of this deity, not of the Hebrew creator God, and that the reason Jesus died was to be ransomed to free any of the creatures of Jehovah who would jump ship and, and become adopted sons and daughters of the God of love. And no one knew this God, and Marcion pointed uh, to passages like where Jesus says, no one knows the Father except for the Son, and anyone to whom the Son deigns to reveal him. Wait a minute, didn't Moses see <laughs> and know God? I, I mean, that's a real good question. Uh, what uh, what could it mean? And uh, you begin to look at these uh, so-called heresies and think maybe originally it was uh, an unknown God coming to light, but quickly people decided, nah, that's going too far out on a limb. Let's combine it with Judaism. Or I wonder if that even reflects just the fact that this started as a mystery faith, a you know a secret handshake type of deal. You know, um, if that's just one more layer of that. I will give him a white stone inscribed with a name that no one but himself will know. I mean, really weird stuff. I went yeah. to the third heaven and learned ineffable secrets that our yes, tongues to may not, yeah, I can't tell you, but you know. That's in, uh, so, so we have our last, like, we two have Corinthians our last four right? questions here. He talks about a mystery faith, and he can't reveal it because otherwise they would find revelation, we can't have that. Yeah, Mark 4, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you Wait, speaking, Mark, Mark 4, 11 sounds like this is a mystery faith. It's not like that. Like Mark is telling the reader this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. We have our last four questions let's here, so let's, let's get those wrapped up. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> okay, a few things. Um, one real quick specific question for you, Rich. Um, the verb you refer to in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, kata. It's not a verb. Okay. Uh, oh, it's, all right. You're just referring to, uh, to, to, according to, uh, according to, okay, yeah. never mind. Not a part um, we, can talk, we can talk about what I thought you were talking about another time. Preposition. Uh, the second thing is, that's the, real that's quick, the just something for your potential edification. I have a theory about Josephus. Uh, prior to the Second World War, the scholarly consensus was generally that it was a complete interpolation, that there wasn't a veneer of, of oh. Christian interpretation on top of it. My theory for why that has changed is that in those days, prior to form criticism, et cetera, the Gospels were more secure then. And so it was easier to jettison Josephus. And these days, the Gospels <laughs> now, are much less now secure. They know that if they don't have Josephus, yeah. they have so nothing just, for the whole first century. So that's just my theory for your first century. For your well, the interesting interest. thing is, uh, I, and I can't remember if I got this got into my book or not, but eventually, like recently, an article was published uh, um, uh, by a particular scholar. I, I have it on one of my Josephus articles on the blog. but. Um, where, oh, and it's in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, when I have my Josephus chapter, uh -huh. and I have a little special note on this. But there's a, it's peer-reviewed literature. This article came out recently where he shows that the, the Testimonium Flavianum, that paragraph in Josephus, is derived from the Emmaus narrative in Luke. And he shows yeah. there's 20 points of similarity, mm -hmm. and they're all in the same order, right. um, which is extremely improbable. So, so uh, this gets you either two results, really. is Either that's, well, that's just a giveaway. It's Christian fabrication that was there inserted. Yeah. Or even if you want to insist it's authentic, it has to be authentic entirely because you can't have just uh, one version and then have middled with it and then suddenly it matches with Luke, right? No. Uh, it's clearly a unified composition, but if, if Josephus wrote it, Josephus was just copying Luke. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you can't yeah. even use Josephus to corroborate Luke. Josephus is not corroborating Luke. Whoever wrote that passage is just using Luke. Mm. Um, and so that's not, that's not usable as evidence. And even Bart Ehrman yeah, says, know, even if every single word of that is true, it's just something a, any Christian on the street could have told him that. Yeah. Yeah. And it <laughs> well, reads like that's what's Right, that's a, good, that's a good line. Yeah. I was just yeah. thinking about why the scholarly <coughs> consensus has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, my, that, that's my, an interesting my, theory. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, real, my real question that I would, I would like any and all of you to, to weigh in on quickly while, while we get through this mm -hmm. is that basically uh, I'm, I'm most interested in, in Mark. I've made it sort of a... Well, my wife would say an obsession. Um, 
it's, you know, it's a fascinating, troubling, sort of weird document. It doesn't fit in the ancient world really at all. It's, it's an orphan. No it's strange. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's a shocking thing. And, yeah. you know, um, so my question is basically like, what is it? And I know that you kind of feel like it's an, Rich, that it's an, that it's an ahumorization, but I, I'd like you, if you do answer, to go somewhat mm -hmm. beyond that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've also, I think, all three said at some point that it's sort of allegorical. Absolutely. And that's a really broad category. I mean, I would, I would characterize it more as perhaps typological. But the one specific thing that if you do answer um, to refer to would be the, my idea that, that Mark actually tells us that it's, a, that it's an allegory, that it's an extended Mark allegory right? Mark in Mark 4, 4 yeah. when he says, I agree. how then will you understand all the yep. parables? What yep. is he even talking about there? Because there really aren't any more parables. There's two. There's the parable of the sower, which is typologically, and this comes a, a lot of it from um, sowing the sowing the gospel. I think mm -hmm. Tol yeah. Tolbert, uh, Mary Tolbert. Mm -hmm. um, right, I got you. <clears throat> you know, there's two. There's the gospel of the sower, and then later on, there's the there's the parable of um, gospel sower, parable sower, parable. and later on, there's the parable of the. Um, well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know these, these are typological guides for how we should read it, and when he says, "How will they know?" all the parables, so right. how would they understand all the parables? He's actually talking about his composition. I agree. So, right. No, I, I agree fully agree. Well. I, I am sure that's what's happening is because it's, it, it's the first time he mentions a parable. He's basically like winking at the audience like, oh, this is the way you're supposed to read my whole gospel. This whole thing is one big yeah, parable, yeah, he's it's, saying. It's, so it's, it's all allegory. So um, where's yeah. this joint with Matthew and Luke? Like, did they misunderstand or were they trying to do the same thing? They misunderstood like you know, a fox. Then, I, I think it, by the time you're getting to Matthew, certainly by the time you're getting to Luke, you're already in the double truth uh, system where, and we have this in Origin. Origin says there were two truths: that there was the literal truth that you needed to to convince the unwashed masses that were too stupid to understand the truth. You had to have this literal meaning, but the but the literal meaning was just a, a, a tool. It literally, it makes no sense. It's well, it's, for him, it was just a tool to convince the the, yeah. the the hoi polloi. But the the sufficiently educated and elite and understanding would know that there's actually a deeper meaning, is the real meaning, the allegorical meaning. Uh, and there's a lot of problems that Origen gets out of by saying, well, the real meaning, and there's no contradiction because the real meaning is this allegorical meaning. Right, right. But then he'll also, he'll outright say, well, let, let them believe the literal meaning so they can be saved. And he literally says, you know, when they, then when they die and they go to heaven, then we can teach them the truth because we'll have <laughs> eternity to explain it to them. Um, and, and no, he really says it, and that's his argument, is that they're going to die any time now, so we have to convince them fast, so we use the literal stories. And then, like he says, no, it's, it's in eternity we can sort it all out. Like, so it, it's, it's this idea of the double truth. There's several books written about that by scholars, and I cite them in my book uh, on the historicity of Jesus. Um, and I think that's it's certainly what's going on in Luke. Like, Luke is writing, he's creating a fake history. He goes, he goes out of his way to make it look like a history book. Um, and yet, when you analyze the stories, you see like Thomas Brody finds that it, it's all fabricated literature. It's like based on King's literature and all the, like it's just rewritten Old Testament stories. So, so Luke is also doing allegory, um, but I think he's doing both. He's doing the literal version to fool the masses, and he's got the, but he's creating the allegorical version to make it respectable for the elite who would never fall for the stupid literal meaning of it. So I think, by the, certainly by the time of Luke, I think we're already in this system where they're trying to write for two audiences yeah, simultaneously. At least, yeah. Luke especially wants to get everybody into Christianity. So he gets the John the Baptist, he gets the Pharisees like Gamaliel. <laughs> he wants women and slaves and everybody on board. And uh, everything he says about Paul is contradicted by everything Paul well, says about true, Paul. Yeah. That as well. You know? Which is sad because everything we love about Paul basically comes from Luke's lying about him. You know, The real Paul is a bit of a drag. <laughs> A great book on uh, Mark is by Robert M. Fowler uh, called Let the Reader Understand, Reader Response, Criticism of the Gospel of Mark, where he shows to a greater degree than I had ever realized that uh, m much of the time, if not most of the time in Mark, what Jesus says is really spoken over the heads of the characters right to the reader, which is why they don't understand what he means by uh, you know, raising from, rising from the dead. What's he talking about? Uh, how come they don't expect uh, the arrest in Gethsemane, even though he's predicted it several <laughs> times, because he's Thank telling you. the reader, not Thank the characters, you. and so on. It's a brilliant book, really eye-opening. <laughs> and it's filled with uh, yeah. Robert this, Fowler. Dr. Carey? Yeah. Um, this, is, well, this is about Christianity and Constantine. Um, okay. I started thinking about this when you explained about a, a battle with uh, an Egyptian sorcerer. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, Constantine's Ark. Um, displays a lot of pagan mm -hmm. stuff to it, and this is supposed to be a, a monument to his greatness, but uh -huh. there's nothing Christian in it. 
Yeah, and well, then, there, there's reasons for that, but go on. Did you have a question? Yeah, and then there's a story. Where does the story come from that he saw this cross in the sky? And yeah, the you probably know more about that than yeah. anything. But, but first, I'll answer that arch question. <clears throat> Remember I mentioned that 50-year civil war and then the collapse of the economy? Um, well, that resulted in basically a massive decimation of the craftsmen of the empire. So you'd lost a lot of traditions, like master to apprentice. You're teaching people, and those people are dying, so they're losing the art. So by the time of Constantine, he couldn't find anybody who could do classical sculpture anymore. No one knew. If you look at the, the sculpture from his period that's made in that period, it's, it's crappy. It looks like the Middle Ages stuff. Uh, it doesn't look like the brilliant, like, you know, da, you know, da Vinci kind of shit that we find in, in the, you know, 100 years earlier because they couldn't find people that could carve anymore, that could do decent art. Um, so uh, when he wanted to create an arch, he was pissed off that he couldn't find anybody that could make the stuff that would make his arch look as good as all these previous arches that are around. So he just went and looted the other arches and put other stuff on his thing from previous arches by, you know, 100, 200 year old emperors. <laughs> and it was just vanity. He didn't care about what the things meant. He just wanted like he wanted his arch to look cool. And so he that was the best he could do was to go cannibalize, you know, wow. ruins essentially. <laughs> mm. okay. well, That's the arch story, but yeah. the the cross as story. As far though. as the Constantine story, um, the story goes that Constantine was a Roman emperor who became Christian after he had this massive vision of the cross, which was really actually the Cairo, but still this Christian symbol in the air and said in this uh, sign conquer. Great story, only that story came out after he died. Um, the original story, and there's like five or six, I think, Life of Constance that we have. In the first story, he won because he was such a kick ass pagan. And, um, uh, and, or, no, no, sorry, uh, that, that his father was a, a, a pagan who was a secret Christian, but he was a Christian all along, and that's why he won. And so somehow along the line, that story fell out of favor, and they had to get the miracle. Um, conversion story instead. And in one of them, he did see the, the vision, but it was simply to tell him that this is what God wants as your battle ends. And it wasn't about him converting. Yeah. And there's reason to believe that he was simply raised as a Christian. There was no conversion. Oh, sure. His mother no was a Christian. Christian. Yeah. Well, La well yeah. Lactantius yeah. was his tutor. Lactantius, this is the freaking Ken Ham of the ancient world. This is, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, this, this guy was so ignorant as a Christian that he has an argument in one of his books. And mind you, you have to understand, science was pretty advanced back then. They knew the Earth was a sphere. They had multiple empirical scientific proofs of this. Aristotle himself lists six scientific empirical proofs of the sphericity of the Earth. But you get to the time of Ptolemy, you know, when you're looking at uh, the Roman astronomer Ptolemy in the second century, elaborate proofs, like it's a done deal. The Earth is a sphere, deal with it. Like Ptolemy even invented, invented the whole idea of latitude and longitude and, and uh, projective cartography so that you could map the Earth because no maps could be accurate if you didn't acknowledge the sphericity of the Earth. And so he developed a whole system to do this. So the science is solid, right? <laughs> and so Lactantius, he's just not having it. And this is, how, this is how hardcore a Christian he is. He says, there's no way the earth is a sphere because that would mean there's upside down people on the other side of it. And that's just ridiculous. Last three questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is, this is for all three of you guys. Um, you've talked about how these theories right now are dangerous and unaccepted, but down the road, eventually things like this are often accepted. They become mainstream. Um, what I would like to know is how do you guys see that change uh, affecting the direction of American Christianity? What would your prediction be? I almost think Christianity is going to go down before mythicism becomes anywhere. I think as long as there's a thing as biblical studies, it's always going to be dominated by Christians. So this is always going to be a minority. Yeah. So. Well, I think we'll always have the Amish. Um, <laughs> and, and I think ultimately what you're going to have is you're going to have, there's two responses you can do. I mean, there's three. There's three responses. One is you're going to go, you know what, this is bogus, and then they leave. Uh, one other response is like, no, that's not true, not true, not true. <laughs> and then that's like the young earth creationists. They're not having evolution, right? So you'll always have those people who just deny science. Um, we even have like non-Christians who deny science and stuff. So that, that denialism is always going to be a problem. But then the third solution is, well, let's work with this. Uh, you have Thomas Brody's version, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but I think it would be much easier for a Christian, especially if you're like a, you know, a liberal sort of young Christian who cares more about the poor than about the trying to outlaw gays. And, you know, and I 
meet a lot of these young Christians yeah. who are just outraged by what the church is doing. It's like, well, why aren't we like feeding the poor? Like, who cares about gay marriage? It's not important. Uh, so you have a lot of these people, like what could they do? And a lot of them are like very much, they're just chucking theology just out. Like they just, just throw it into the sea. They don't care. It's like they just want to strip Jesus down to like the basic, you know, cool guy Jesus. And I think if you were to do something like this, it would be easy to admit, like if I have an on the historicity of Jesus, the whole theory I'm posing against uh, historicity is Doherty's thesis, which is the idea that it started as a revelatory religion and that the gospels are allegories. Um, now, you could theoretically just say, you know what? Not only is that true, but it's true, <laughs> right? You could say, like, like, there really was a Jesus. He really was crucified by Satan in outer the space. The behind the lies is yeah. more true than Exactly. The you could go back to the original religion of Paul and say that, yeah, the Gospels are allegories. That's obvious. They're brilliant. They're clearly divinely inspired allegories. Uh, so you They're could... super true. You, yeah, you could... <laughs> exactly. You could rescue Christianity in that sense. It just requires you to abandon so much traditional... Uh, you know, dead wood, essentially. But uh, it's just so the conservatives can't do this. But I think there, there are liberals who could. I think it's possible for a younger generation to just radically reinterpret Christian theology this way. I think there's a lot of truthiness in what yeah, you say. And I, I, I think inevitably that will happen. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, Albert Schweitzer. Mm. I, I got the impression that he's kind of the godfather of the inquiry into the historicity of Jesus. Am I completely wrong? Nope. Well, yeah, that's fair. I mean, there him. were there were people before him, yeah. but he's the first person to really turn it into a systematic study and to actually, I mean, like, he, everything goes back to him, really, in terms and he, of And he was the current. first one to say that everybody who's done a biography of Jesus is showing a mirror of themselves when they do it. Yeah, so yeah. but he, he kind of created the, the systematic study that, that evolved into what we're doing now. That's Though true. Though he did believe that Jesus was a historical character and that Matthew and Mark were basically reliable sources, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, just the opposite of Schleiermacher, who thought Luke and John were the only reliable <laughs> ones. But uh, he he was very daring and came up with this brilliant interpretation of the weird stuff Jesus says, give away everything you own and all that. So, well, this would make sense if he believed the end of the world yeah. was at hand. It's really powerful. Uh, there are big problems with it, who knows, but he, he didn't uh, think that there was no Jesus, though he did treat uh, the question. Uh, I, I'm even more of a nut than these guys because uh, <laughs> I, I also think that uh, the Pauline epistles, none of them are authentic. Uh, and, uh, that's, uh, and, and Schweitzer tries to give that a fair hearing in his book, Paul is, and His Interpreters, and incredibly brilliant. The guy had four earned doctorates. Uh, he was really a superman, a mutant, this guy, and uh, <laughs> uh, just absolutely incredible. And, uh, but he was, he did like lay down the basic That's charter. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, and hmm. he was also notorious for saying that the real Jesus is not going to be of any use to any Christians well, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. He, yeah. Did, he yeah. did say that. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Let's give him another round of applause. And thank you all again for coming and supporting our event. Um, just two quick things.